There's um, there's a new Indiana Jones film out, isn't there? Yeah. So bless him, Harrison Ford at uh, 79, 80, does it again. Okay. There's hope for me yet, isn't there? So there we go. So uh, yeah. So this one's just been released. Um, and um, the first film, of course, was called, can you remember first Indiana Jones film? Raiders of the Lost Ark. <clears throat> So kind of in tribute to that this morning, I've called this sermon Archaeological Discoveries. Oh, I know, it's the nearest I could get to it, but there we go. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's a bit of a plug for uh, blessing for Harrison Ford. Um, okay, so uh, we've spent um, a few weeks in the Old Testament in, in 1 Samuel. Um, I... I do get quite excited about the Old Testament. I'm sorry, I do, I do enjoy it, but there we go. I uh, should stop apologizing, shouldn't I, and just get on with it. So um, here we are. We spent a few weeks in the Old Testament, and it's great, isn't it? Yay! Thank you, Nick. That's okay. Brilliant. And uh, we're looking at the story of, of Samuel, how God is raising up a new leader, because uh, something's gone wrong amongst his people, particularly the spiritual leaders of the nation. Something's gone wrong there. They've They've just got, they've almost got over familiar with this idea of faith and following, and they're treating God with disdain. So he's raising up this new leader for his people to replace the priesthood that's uh, led by uh, Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, boo the bad guys, they're kind of the villains of this piece really, or have been. But for the next three chapters that we're in now, there is no mention of Samuel at all, the boy Samuel. It all goes quiet about Samuel for a spell. And he'll pop up again in chapter 7. And the attention shifts and focuses on um, the outworking of this prophetic word that God has given to his people. They've kind of had their warning. They were warned. Eli's been warned. The prophecies have been given to him. Um, they didn't listen. They didn't listen. And so God acts, and he does. And there are some gory details that go on. We're going to skip those, actually. because. Um, uh, but Hophni and Phinehas, uh, this is the Reader's Digest version, Hophni and Phinehas, they're killed in battle go out there a bit overconfident. And their father, Eli, he dies when he hears the news of what's happened to his sons and also the news of what happens to the ark, the ark that gets captured by the Philistines. So if you want to read it up when you get home, by all means do. 1 Samuel 4 tells the story of Israel's defeat in battle by the neighboring Philistines. Um, and Without prayer, without seeking God's guidance, the Israelites bring the ark out of its worship center in Shiloh. They take it down to the battlefield for a rematch. They think, this is fine, we've got this, we're going to win, because this means that God is with us, doesn't it? And they, they treat it like a talisman, a lucky charm, and they don't even consult God about it. Don't even ask him. Don't even check in with him about what they're doing. They assume that victory is in the bag. We've got the ark. And... Of course, they get beat up. They've got no regard for God's will. They're taking him for granted, and it's a disaster. The battle is lost. The priests are lost, those spiritual leaders gone. The ark is captured and taken away by the Philistines. Woohoo, they think, look what we've done. Look what we've captured, the visible sign of the holy presence of God. Now we've got it, is what the Philistines are thinking that focal point of God's presence among his people, the ark, has gone. And this episode is a picture of how far Israel has kind of strayed from God. And we're going to listen to what happens next. And um, uh, Brian has, uh, has, has come in this morning. He's going to read it for us. Oh, there he is. He's in the corner. Come to the front, Brian. That's fine. And um, when you listen to this, when it was written, there is actually humor in this as it was written. There is um, almost a bit of... Um, it's almost a bit like panto, mocking pantomime in it, actually, in the way that this was written way back when. Um, but uh, Brian is going to do his best with this now for us. So here we go, Brian. Good morning, everyone. 
Samuel chapter 5 and on to chapter 6 verse 2. The ark in Ashdod and Ekron. After the Philistines had captured the ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who enter Dagon's temple at Ashdod step on the threshold. The Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation upon them and afflicted them with tumors. When the men of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us because his hand is heavy upon us and upon Dagon our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Have the ark of the God of Israel moved to Gath. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. But after they'd moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of the God to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They've brought the ark of the God of Israel round to us to kill us and our people. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy upon it. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory for seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Brian. That's great. Um, got a little recap. There's a, a little bit of a PowerPoint, Luke, I think. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Um, so archaeological discoveries. Well, I was quite pleased with that anyway. There we go. Um, so there it is. Uh, you've seen that picture before. And um, we, uh, we had a look at uh, some of this just in headline form a few weeks ago. And the, the ark... Um, God, um, right back in the uh, the beginnings of the Old Testament there in the book of Exodus, uh, led the Hebrews out of captivity in Egypt, presenced himself with his people, led them through that pillar of uh, cloud and fire by uh, day and night. Um, and they were wandering people, and they could have had, sort of had this mobile place of worship with them called the tabernacle. And within it was the ark, uh, the, the ark of the covenant, the most important piece of furniture, if you like, of that worship center. And um, it's a simple wooden box overlaid with gold. And um, as you remember from last time around, people are not allowed to touch it, hence it's uh, carried on those poles there. And it contained two stone tablets, uh, the uh, tablets uh, of the testimony, the Ten Commandments, the law, which God had given to Moses. They're all in there. And it's sometimes called the Ark of the Covenant, sometimes called the Ark of the Testament, Testimony when you read in the Old Testament there. And um, always kept in a very, very holy place. And it'd been kept in the worship center in Shiloh uh, in, this, uh, in our recent readings from uh, Samuel. 
So on the lid, you've got the, uh, the carved cherubim there, and that top bit there is kind of called the mercy seat. And when it was uh, in the, uh, the center there, in, the, in the, the holy place, the worship center, it was round about there that, uh, that the presence of God, uh, they felt, uh, came and met with them. So very, um, I guess, holy piece of furniture. Um, and it was this that they took out of the, um, the worship center in Shiloh and took onto the battlefield with them, and they lost it. They lost it. This would normally be parked at the center of the nation, of the peoples. If you read um, in Exodus, it's uh, as the Hebrews traveled around, this was always at the center of their camp whenever they camped. Um, and it's kind of a, a sign of God's presence. So I've uh, been through all of that. That's the map we've seen before. And uh, this is what happened. It was in Shiloh uh, on the top right-hand corner. They took it there to where the Red Star is. There was a battle around out there. The people lost. It has been captured. And the Ark is taken into Philistine territory in the green there. And it's a trophy. It's a trophy. It, it's a sign that they've won. Look what we've captured. And they're quite full of themselves. So um, that's your recap. Okay with that? That's uh, the geography, if you like. So, um, oh, sorry. Thanks, Luke. Took it onto the song. There we go. So the Philistines, they are puffed up in victory. They're full of it. Uh, all the adrenaline's going. Um, They've captured the ark and they take it to the city to show it off to Ashdod. Show it off. Look, look what we've done. This is the premier city of what's called the Pentapolis. There are five big cities in uh, the Philistine um, land there. And this trophy ark is taken uh, before the image of their own god, their idol, Dagon. They put it into his shrine, um, his place of worship. Um, look what our God has done to your God. That's kind of what they're saying. The point is clear. Israel's God, represented by this ark, is the defeated God. And he is brought before victorious Dagon and is brought into Dagon's place, right into the center of Dagon's territory, into this, the big city, into the shrine in the center of the big city. This is a picture of humiliation, victory for the, for the Philistines. Or so they think. So they think. And next morning, the Philistines wake up, and before they've had time to pour the milk on their cornflakes, the cry goes up, come and see what's happened. What's happened? And their religious leaders run into Dagon's uh, shrine, the worship place there, and Dagon is down on his face, this stone or wooden idol, whatever it is, flat on his face in front of the ark. How embarrassing, don't you think? How embarrassing for them. Dagon bows down to Israel's God. And he's doing it on Philistine territory. He's supposed to be God of this land, and yet there he is, flat on his face in front of the ark. Where Dagon is supposed to be all-powerful and in control, the ark seems to represent something more powerful. And the, uh, the people come out, and it's a bit like a panto. And the priests come, and they lift Dagon back up, and they dust him off and all the rest of it, and they put him back in his place. Maybe something happened. Maybe he just slipped and fell over. There's a little wobble. And they put him back where he should be. And the way it's, it's kind of written, it's, it's quite laughable. It's a bit of a comedy thing that's going on, really, because there's, there's a tongue-in-cheek as the writer writes this. Look how humiliating this is. They've got to pick this God up. The, the people have got to pick him back up and set him straight and all the rest of it. And 
the story would have been read by generations afterwards. And you can almost hear them round the campfire, the Israelites listening as they tell the story on to their children and grandchildren. This is what happens to these other so-called gods when they come before our God. And again, Dagon falls. And he falls before the ark again, a picture of homage. And somehow or other, this time, there is just the torso on the ground and the head and the arms are right over there by the door, broken off and kind of thrown away. And this, this idea that they're in the doorway, the, the threshold is kind of the entrance to the holy place and the fact that Dagon's head and arms are over there on the threshold not allowed in anymore means that this isn't his holy place anymore it's God's holy place and Dagon has been broken and thrown out over there and God is showing the Philistines who really is in charge Dagon is banished. He's just a broken torso here. His other bits are out there. The humor is biting, actually. It's biting. Dagon's homage, Dagon's helplessness, even on his home turf, Dagon's destruction, holiness, and worship belong to God alone. That's what's going on here. His is the glory, no one else's. Israel's God, Yahweh, is supreme. It turns out the Philistines have won nothing. They were just playing a part in God's sovereign plan. They were instruments in his purposes. But the message to Israel is clear. How dare you take me for granted? How dare you assume that I'm just a pawn in your game fighting for you? How dare you disrespect me? The episode shows that God is actually self-sufficient and supreme. He can defend himself. And he's going to show how he can get back to Israel, the ark that belongs to him, without Israel's help. It will just happen. At this point, the Philistines begin to realize that it's not really the ark that's fallen into their hands, so much as them having fallen into the hands of God. Verse 6 says, the Lord's hand was heavy on the people in the city of Ashdod, where they've taken the ark. What happens next kind of scatters any thoughts of the Philistines saving face in this at all. They try and hang on to the ark, really, to keep it. And um, they pass it, pass it around from city to city. At least if it's still in our land, we can show that we had the victory that we've, we've won. Um, and after six months, they are desperate to be rid of it. Look at the trouble it's causing. The, the nation has no doubt that the sickness and plagues that are happening in all these different cities as the ark is passed around, they've no doubt that this is from God. They're being afflicted. And they are afraid. They're afraid. The Philistines have, over this six or seven months, started to develop a respect and an awe of God. They realize who God is, who is sovereign. And they've developed the very thing that Israel had lost. They've started to have some reverence for God. Do you see the contrast and the lesson that's being taught and learned here in what's going on? And now these Philistines, they've got to the point where they've actually had enough. They don't want this ark around anymore. What should we do? What should we do with this? Tell us how we can send it back to its place. They actually want to send it back to Israel. And we'll cover that uh, next week and uh, see what goes on. 
But I guess the point that I want to make this morning and uh, our takeaway is this. We're reminded just to think about, to consider whether we take God for granted, treat him too casually. Oh yeah, God forgives. That's what he does, isn't it? Do we abuse the grace of knowing our Lord? Do we make a bit more space maybe for fear and reverence and regard? Who does get the glory? And do we make a point of ensuring that he does? Who is the root of the fruit in your life? And Israel, as a people, particularly their their religious leaders, had got very, very complacent, very casual. They were just doing religion, routine, empty, dry. They'd forgotten who they were doing it for. And the Philistines learned in seven months what the Israelites had taken over 450 years to forget that God is supreme and all-powerful. He doesn't actually need anyone, but he does invite us to follow him and walk with him. Faith can become complacent. Don't let that be us. And sometimes a wake-up call is necessary just to remind us who it is that we follow, who it is that we worship. Second thing, these events also illustrated something to Israel and the Philistines, that God is God everywhere and anywhere. He is sovereign. He rules and reigns. Back in the ancient Near East, back in Bible times, many nations thought of their gods as being territorial. This is our God who looks after our bits within our borders and he'll protect us and so on. And they thought in those terms it was all quite small and quite parochial. But God showed actually, no, 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 that's not me. I am bigger. I am sovereign everywhere and anywhere I go. I am God. I am God. And the Philistines learnt that. And Israel, watching on, learnt it as well. They were given a spectacle of actually how powerful the God is that they follow. Quite incredible. It's a lesson to Israel and to the Philistines, and it's a lesson for us too. God is is the starting point, not us. God is the starting point. And I guess second takeaway this morning, start with him. Start with him. That's where life starts. Build your life on him. Let him be the root of the fruit in your life. I'm going to pause it there. I'm going to pick the story up next week and see what happens next. And uh, it gets quite interesting then as well. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are Lord, that you are sovereign, that you rule and reign, that there is no limit to who you are and where you are and what you can do. And for us in our lives, help us to hang on to that and to remember it. We want to be shaped by these truths of who you are, formed by them, knowing you, Jesus. There is no greater thing. And so thank you for reminding us through scripture of who you are, all powerful, all present, all knowing, and that you know us and you love us. And in Jesus, we know this. Praise you again in his name. Amen.